Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter fan cast where we discuss all things Carpenter through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and we wish today. We get little spurts of it today. That's true. We do get little spurts, little joyous spurts. That just does not sound right. (laughs) (laughs) Joining me is only Noel, my co-host from the States. How are you, Noel? I am doing good. I should let people know that we recorded this episode two weeks ago, and then we lost the file. We did. Michael Myers killed it. He slowly stalked it. You know, would always just be glancing through windows. (laughs) Dressed up as a boyfriend at some point, tried to lure us in. And sadly, our episode fell victim. And so this is us re-recording. Yes. So if it sounds like we're trying to kind of recreate from memory a conversation we had two weeks ago, it's because we partially are. My memory is so bad that this is going to be interesting. This is my first time re-recording something, so I've always heard about it. I've heard tell of it from podcasts I enjoy, but this is my first time participating in it. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I've never had to re-record an episode two from scratch. There you go. And I hate live remakes. We only lost one episode and we never redid it. Ah, uh, this we don't really have that option. We bend space and time. Oh, there's Michael Myers. A little tidbit for you guys. I have the movie playing silently, commentary uh, track style. So now I get to relive the magic and wonder of Halloween 5. So why don't we start with, is this a film that you had seen before? Yes, I have seen all the Halloween films at least once before. I believe this, I can't even remember. Maybe my third, maybe my fourth time seeing it. I keep getting it in my head that I should rewatch the Halloween films, and usually by this point, spoiler alert, I am regretting that decision. But (laughs) yeah, it's a film I've seen before. I can never remember what happens in it. Five and six are usually very hazy in my memory and kind of jumbled together. But uh, yes, I have indeed seen it. And same here, because I went through all the Halloween films back in the 90s when I was on my first big slasher kick. And yeah, five and six are the ones I've probably watched the least. I know I saw them both once each, and this was one of those ones where I vividly remembered certain things of it. But boy, a lot of it was just lost to time, to the point where I thought one of the actors was returning from part four and wasn't. Yeah, you showed me the picture. It's eerie. It was a completely different person and a completely different character. And yet, in my memory from watching it in my teens, I was like, oh yeah, they took that character from part four and that actress. And she came back for part five, absolutely. They have kind of similar hairstyles. And they're both the perky best friend of Rachel. That's right. It's like, why does she need two? Can't you just have one perky best friend? (laughs) Why don't we just go ahead and run through their production notes real quick? Go right ahead. Halloween 5 was greenlit immediately after the release of Halloween 4, and unlike Halloween 4, which was rushed through production in just a few months, this one got to take its time over the course of a year, with the script completed by the following March, shooting beginning in May, and the film being released on October 13th, 1989. Halloween 5 was again produced and distributed by Mustafa Akkad through his companies Troncus International and Galaxy International. Joining him as producer was Ramsey Thomas. This was Thomas's only film as a full producer, but he also wrote and directed under the moniker Alan Smithy, a horror film called Appointment with Fear, which was also produced by Mustafa Akkad. I should mention that the director and writer of the last film, Donald Petrie and Alan B. McElroy, had planned to come back for a part five. But they weren't able to, and the director of this film, Dominique Othenin, Othenin Gerard, I'm not sure how to pronounce it perfectly. It's partially French, partially Swiss. Swiss? Swish. I'm having a good time. <laughs> You've been into the schnapps. <laughs> yeah. He was given the script to look at, walked into Mustafa Akkad's office, and threw it in the trash bin and said, I can do better. <laughs> and could he? <laughs> yeah, we'll see. So he directed the film and co-wrote it. As I said, he was a Swiss filmmaker, and he debuted in the mid-80s with a pair of horror films, After Darkness and The Hospice, and After Halloween carried on in the genre with Night Angel and The Omen 4, as well as the action films Beyond Desire, Adrenaline, and The Crusaders, as well as several installments of the erotica franchises Red Shoe Diaries and Private Lessons. I was going to say, these all sound like late-night cable films. Oh, yeah. 
He's since returned back to Europe and he's done a whole bunch of films and television works in France and, and Switzerland, most of which have never come out over here. And the other writers were Michael Jacobs, who wrote Certain Fury 315 and American Surveillance, which he also directed, and Shem Bitterman, which was an interesting get because he's a playwright who became noted for writing and directing indie drama films like Out of the Rain, Tinseltown, Open House, Off the Lip, The Nexa One Mile, Play Dead, The Job, Betty and Coretta, and Whitney, the Whitney Houston biopic directed by Angela Bassett. Hmm. So that is an interesting group of people making this movie. Absolutely. And I should point out that I'm not sure what the direct tie is, but a large chunk of the production crew, like the camera crew, the set people, the costumers, all stuff, all came straight off of Tales from the Dark Side, the TV series. I'm wondering if it was just shooting in the same area at the time. And then a lot of them would carry on to, of course, do Tales from the Dark Side, the movie. It could be that they were just a proximity, because I know that when my uh, wife, uh, well, Julia, the yeah. co-host... <laughs> works on projects they'll just bounce back and forth at the time she was working with the saw franchise they would just be like oh we're doing a saw and now we're doing this and so on and so forth we pick a location now who are the people who are available in the location that's right <laughs> i think as we pointed out in the last episode this was again filmed in salt lake city utah where they filmed part four beautiful downtown salt lake city utah where murders come true ah uh, so the film was made on a budget of three million and pulled in a total gross of just under 12 million it opened number two behind the debut of Look Who's Talking. The following week, it dropped to number six and then to number 12 when Shocker and the Bear came out. By its fourth week, it no longer appears on the top 20. Part four did so well that it instantly greenlit part five for the next year. Part five did not do terribly, but it would be like another, I want to say, four or five years before part six came along. It wasn't like an instant, OK, let's follow this up with another one. Mm -hmm. So anything else to add before I jump into the synopsis? No, I don't think so. I think you covered it. All right. Following the events of the last movie, Michael escaped death by mineshaft by being swept along an underground river, which just happened to be down there, where he was rescued and nursed back to health by a hobo, whom Michael kills upon waking up one year later. It's Halloween again, and an institute for troubled children is prepping for a costume party, including Jamie, who's also struggling from shock-induced mutism, and is having brutal dreams of when she stabbed her foster mother the year prior. Her dreams take on a new angle, psychically connecting her with Michael as he returns to town and kills Jamie's sister Rachel and their pet dog. With Jamie unable to speak, despite the increasingly violent proddings of Dr. Loomis, Michael starts stalking Rachel's best friend Tina and all her other teenage pals as they plan a late-night party at a farm involving much booze and fornication. Tina narrowly and unknowingly escapes Michael at one point, but ignoring the now-speaking Jamie, she still hits the party where her friends and a pair of comical sound effects police officers are killed off. Jamie escapes the Institute to try to save her, but Tina ends up dying to protect the girl from Michael. Loomis and the sheriff set Jamie as bait in Michael's abandoned family home, but the majority of the police force is lured away when Michael attacks the Institute, and he picks off whatever cops are left before mauling Loomis and cornering Jamie in the attic, where she lays in a coffin while surrounded by the bodies of Rachel and her friends. Jamie almost breaks through to Michael when she gets him to remove his mask and wipes at a tear in his eye, but he turns violent again. Loomis lurches back in from the shadows, using Jamie as bait to lure Michael to a steel net and a gun full of trank darts, but as Michael goes down, so too does Loomis of a heart attack. Throughout the movie, we've seen a mysterious man in black, and with Michael locked up behind bars, the man in black enters the police station with a hail of gunfire. Jamie wanders in through the bodies of slain officers and finds Michael's cell, empty with the doors blown open. Alex, do you recommend Halloween 5? No, I don't. <laughs> it is uh, not a very good movie. It's a bit of a chore to watch. Whatever I said about four, I semi retract it because <laughs> goddamn, does it get worse. It's not nice to watch. It's not fun to watch. I don't know. I judge these movies so harshly because I'm by myself, usually late at night. And I'm just like, why the hell am I watching this? It's fair. You're not wrong to do so. You're OK. You're among friends. This is a safe place. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like if I was with other people, I would have had a better time watching this. These things are kind of like a communal thing. Horrors, whether they're good or bad in my estimation. But regardless, it's kind of nastier, this one. Everyone's just a little bit mean. I think that the little girl, Jamie, is put through paces a little bit more than she should be. I think she does a fantastic job, and I think that makes it even more traumatic to watch. I don't want to talk about everything right off the bat, but just not a fun movie to watch. I 100% agree with you. This is just, it's dreary, it's sloppy, it's incredibly atmospheric without being scary. It's just kind of dull. 
It's a confusing movie where I don't know why people are doing the things they're doing. I don't know why the filmmakers are making the choices they're making. And yet there are some things to like about it, which I will get to. But it's like the inverse of part four, where part four had a lot of things that it got right and its heart was in the right place. And that made up for all the things that it did wrong. Mm -hmm. This one, it's like everything that worked in part four doesn't work here. The few things that didn't work in part four do work here, but it's like a whole inverse of the balance. Now the balance has shifted against it. It's not a well-made movie. No. Which is sad, given that they had more time to make it than they did part four, but it's just, it's, yeah. I found that part four was more cohesive, and this just feels like scenes from a murder, basically. More coherent. Yeah, <laughs> and this is just like what you expect from a horror film, but they are put together with a very weak glue. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the worst of it is Rachel, Jamie's sister, who was the really great character in part four. Yes. You know, the whole sisterhood between her and Jamie. And then in this one, you know, you get a good opening scene between the two of them. But then we do the whole horror thing. And this was the exact same thing that happened in the opening of Friday the 13th Part 2, where you take the girl who survived the first movie, mm -hmm. and we just follow her around her apartment for 10 minutes as she's dancing to music, taking off all of her clothing, taking a shower, running around in a towel, throwing on a few strips of clothing, and then getting stabbed to death. Yeah, which I find almost sadistic when they make it last too long. There's like tension and then there's, why are you doing this? Because at least in like something like Scream, Drew Barrymore is talking. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, slasher films have their exploitative elements, but this was not a character who deserved that after all that she went through in part four. No, it just feels like kicking you. Even like when I saw this, when she's just like, hey, silly face to her uh, adopted sister or whatever. And I'm just like, ah, oh, come on. We know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, we built such an interesting bond between them. We don't see the foster parents again. They're just mentioned in dialogue. Yeah. And then to just kill that relationship. Yeah, it feels like the people here are just like, what was that movie about? Ah, uh, who cares? Get rid of that part and like sweep it aside. We've got real work to do. And it's just so cheap. Yeah. I know in the earliest drafts of the script, not the draft that I read, sadly, but in the earliest drafts, it was Tina who gets killed 10 minutes in. Who, Tina is the perky best friend who we then follow for the rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. And it was Rachel that we were then going to follow dealing with her boyfriend and the party. And do I go out with my friends or do I stay with my sister who's still going through this? And then she was supposed to die near the end of the movie, as Tina does. And I'm like, that would have been more deserving of the character. It would have made a lot more sense. I kind of like it when they flip those character dynamics and something. But you could have just knocked Rachel out or something. Yeah, just taken her out of the equation where she's like, she's in a coma. That's fine. I do actually enjoy Tina, who's the kind of bubbly friend, because she just has this personality and this charisma. And what I like is that she's typically the character who would be killed off in the first 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And yet she gets to go through this adventure. But I don't like that it comes at the cost of Rachel. No, it's true. And then you just feel even worse for Jamie, the Daniel Harris character, because now she doesn't have Rachel no. as support there for the entire rest of the movie. And then you get that scene near the end where it's like she sees the dead Rachel and screams out her name. And that's a good moment. It's heartbreaking. But the movie didn't earn that. No, it didn't earn that. It seems like an afterthought. It's very much in the vein of the Friday the 13th films where the lone protagonist finds everyone in the last like 15 minutes of the movie before Jason reveals himself. And what I love is in the behind the scenes, they have an interview with the actress who plays Rachel. She's still to this day pissed that they did that to her character. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't know why they would do that. It doesn't serve the story in any capacity to remove her. And it kind of takes away a lot of the stakes. Because yeah. then you're just like, who are these people now? Are, am I caring for them? What's going on? It would be like if Jamie Lee Curtis went through everything that she went through in Halloween. And then in Halloween 2, she's that girl that Michael kills in the first 10 minutes. Yeah, which very well could have happened knowing the 1980s and the slasher scene of that day. And of course it will happen. We'll get to Halloween 8. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the director on his commentary, the director sounds like a very delightful and warm and kind person. But there are so many things he said in the commentary. It's like, you just don't get it. He's talking about how, yes, we needed to raise the stakes. We needed to show that anyone could be killed and... I love later after this movie came out, Mustafa and Kyle were like, no, that was a mistake. That was stupid. <laughs> Rachel was one of our big characters. We ruined it. Yeah, they could have had their little trilogy like Nightmare on Elm Street with uh, 
what's their name? Oh, the Dream Warriors trilogy, yeah. Yeah, Dream Warriors, Child, and whatever. I still like the Dream Trilogy. Anyways, why don't we just talk about Daniel Harris as Jamie? Fantastic. Like I said before, I think I uh, jumped the gun a little bit, but she's almost too good in this role. I don't even think this movie deserves her performance. They put her through a lot of crap, but my God. God, she is just a tour de force committed actress. She was 11 when she did this, and it's just an excellent performance. Yeah, just her circumstances and the material she was given and the production values, I would give this child an Oscar. <laughs> I mean, like, even in the early parts when she's mute. Yeah. You know, you see the character doing sign language. She uses kisses as language. You know, the whole bit where she wakes up in bed screaming, but there's no sound coming out of her throat. Yeah, no, she sells everything right off the bat. I think she's giving the performance that a certain other actor should have given in this movie. I know who that actor is and we'll get to it. Yeah. But I think if this movie is worth watching for anything, I think it is her performance. Again, I'm not recommending the movie. (laughs) I mean, if you enjoy her performance in part four, this is worth watching just to see more of her performance and her giving an even more powerful performance. It's just a shame that it's in the midst of such a direct movie. Yeah, if you want to see something very off-putting as seeing one actor on fire in an otherwise garbage movie, you can watch her. (laughs) I mean, and there are so many scenes, like, you know, the scene where she's running from the figure who turns out to be the gardener, or bits of her running around the house by herself, are just so clumsily put together, but she's so captivating in the performance that she's giving. Yeah, she's great. I think she should be um, regarded as, like, one of the scream queens. She is. Is she? Yeah. Her character of Jamie is one of the key characters in the Halloween franchise, even though it's in some of the weaker movies. There you go. Well, I mean, it's just like, you know, the character again from Elm Street's 4 and 5. Yeah. Those movies aren't beloved, but that character is. Yeah. And why don't we go ahead and talk about that weaker performance? <sighs> Mr. Donald Pleasance. I don't know if I could talk about this again. (laughs) I know it's sad that... It is very sad. Even in part four, which was not the strongest of movies... No. Part of what made that movie so strong was he still brought it as Loomis and was still captivating as Loomis. Yeah, I'm on record as stating that he was excellent in that film, as all his performances were excellent. Up until re-watching this, I was just like, Donald Pleasance does not give a bum note. And this one, the fires finally burned out. Yeah. Uh, I feel really bad. And I think you were telling me the last time it's under, like, understandable circumstances. Some of the actors in the behind the scenes features said that he was incredibly sweet and incredibly professional. He was always on set on time. He always knew his lines. He would always go out to dinner with all the cast and crew and tell stories. There's a great story from Daniel Harris where he was only on set for a week. And he was the only actor who had this massive trailer, like a full personal trailer all to himself. And when he left, he says, keep this trailer on set. Give it to Daniel Harris. She is the star of this movie. She deserves that trailer. But he was drinking pretty regularly. She was talking about how he always had this smell on him when they made this movie. That wasn't until later years that she recognized that was bourbon, you know? And it's like, I don't think he was like fully alcoholic, but he was at the bottle pretty regularly. Which, yeah, you shouldn't be drinking on the job. And it shows. Yeah. He's just kind of slurry. He's just kind of... Lethargic. Lethargic. And then even just the character is so poorly written in that, you know, in part four, we talked about, boy, it would be interesting to see what Loomis would actually be like as a therapist. (laughs) And in this one, his therapeutic technique is to literally just lean down into someone's face. Yeah. Like huddle over a child, put your face right in their face and just start being like, why aren't you speaking? Why aren't you telling me what I want to hear? Why? Every time I look over at the movie that's playing beside me, he is perched over that poor child like the specter of death, (laughs) just yelling in her face. Yeah. And I just can't help but think, I'm like, maybe you caused Michael Myers. (laughs) And shaking her and all this stuff. And he comes up with this weird theory of, they even have a couple of scenes where it's like him and Michael, and he's like, Jamie is the key to curing you. She can give you peace to your rage. How? Where is he getting that theory? Yeah, I'd like to see this study that you've done. I want to see some sources. I want to see some research. I love how even the nurses are like, why are we letting this man around this child? (laughs) Dude, back off. Yeah, I can't even imagine because she's not under his care, I don't think. I think he's just like so obsessed with the case. 
Does he work at that particular hospital? I don't even think that it's his hospital. I think he just keeps showing up and nobody knows how to tell him to go away. He's just got tenure at every hospital, I think. Because <laughs> there is another doctor who is the main doctor in charge there, but yeah. Yeah, who also isn't doing a very good job. No one seems to be caring that much. I think that nurse really cares for her, but doesn't know what to do. No, she just seems to be very frantic, which I've never seen a nurse behave that way. I'm, they're usually quite composed. Well, I think it's part of this director's technique I kind of like some of his cinematography in that he gets a handheld camera and is kind of like up close in people's faces. That kind of adds some tension, but then he's like has all the actors now lean in really close, get in each other's faces, and it just feels awkward. Acting! <laughs> I get what he's going for, just trying to create some intensity and all that stuff, and sometimes it succeeds. Yeah, but the, sometimes I'm just like, you're not directing Othello. Like, get everyone away from each other. <laughs> and again, Donald Pleasance literally looks like a drunk old man just draping himself over a child. Yeah, which, if he had the energy, would be good, but this just looks like he's trying to find a place to sleep. I mean, we made fun of that in part four, where Loomis's way of saying hello is to suddenly lurch out of the shadows and drape over someone and say evil. <laughs> he does that literally twice in this movie. There are two times in the last half hour where Jamie is just walking around in dark shadows and then suddenly Loomis springs out and literally just drapes over her and goes like, oh, be well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a big difference between that sort of hammer horror vibe and just crazy uncle. And I think they took it to heart a little too much to where his entire performance is spent draped over people. Yeah, it's true. It's just sad. There's that scene where it's him and Michael on the stairwell, where it could have been touching, where he's talking to Michael and he's coming up to him and he's reaching for the knife. That could have been a touching moment. Mm -hmm. Everything is just so burned out. The filmmaking, his performance... He was the glue that was holding these sequels together. Yeah. And to see just how far he's fallen already, and we still have another one to go. Oh, yeah. I know. And I don't think it's going to get much better. And I should point out that him having the heart attack there at the end after he beat Michael, and then he literally ends the movie by draping on top of Michael. <laughs> <laughs> that was supposed to be Loomis's death. This was supposed to be the end of Loomis in these movies. We'll get to part six. I honestly don't remember much of his involvement in part six. I know that's the film that he passed away while making, so they didn't even finish filming his entire role. Yeah, I remember vaguely he dies off camera. That's going to be interesting because we got both cuts of that movie and I've got a draft of the script. So we'll see what happens there. We're going to get to the bottom of part six. But yeah, oh man, he just, he's, he's done. Yep. And I hate to say it because again, Donald Pleasant sounded like he was a sweet, lovely man. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, past glories and all that stuff. He just went two films too far. Two films too far. Age and alcohol caught up with him. Yep, it's true. Well, let me just talk about Michael. First off, let's talk about the mask. Mm -hmm. All the films, even part four, for as badly as it was painted, still used that William Shatner mold. Right. This was the first one where they went to K&B, a makeup effects studio, and they said, make us a mask. <laughs> and they sculpted this one from scratch, and it looks awful. Yeah, it does. Especially that flared neck. Yeah, the neck is what bothers me the most. It's like a disco neck. He looks like he's about to spit poison at Nedry's face. That's, a, yes. <laughs> it's about to start rattling. <laughs> K&B is a makeup effects studio. They've gone on to become one of the top guys. They still do most of the effects for Walking Dead and stuff like that. I've always found their makeup to be very inconsistent, and this film is no exception. We don't really get much in the way of gore effects. No, it's not particularly gory films. Like, I've said this before, that it always feels like the TV movie equivalent of a Halloween film. Like, I know that it's obviously too much for TV. Well... This one, I'll grant you more because, you know, as with the last film, despite the fact that there's a sex scene, there's no actual nudity. Yeah, that's true. Part four was definitely a lot gorier. But this one, they talked about how they had a hard time getting the makeup effects to work. Like that whole guy getting speared with the pitchfork was supposed to be a lot gorier, but they couldn't get the effect to work. <laughs> and like you were supposed to see the woman beheaded by the scythe, but they couldn't get the effect to work. The mask is just kind of the epitome of that's how you overthink things. Yeah. That's also the problem with the Rob Zombie one is it's oh, a yeah. way overthought. It's an overdone mask. In parts one and two, it was literally, hey, there's this William Shatner mask. Let's just do a few things to it and then run with it. Well, yeah, the whole point of this is how generic it is. It's a shape. Yeah. And you, know, I even just sent you that photo of Jamie Lee Curtis wearing the mask. Yeah. And it has this odd, unsettling quality to it. It does. Anyone who puts it on, it's what it does to the eyes. It kind of like makes your eyes very sunken. And it's also, you know, it's kind of a, 
I hate to say this to William Shatner, but it's kind of a chubby face. <laughs> it looks like just a normal pasty white dude. Yeah. And in this one, they're trying to make it too lean, too skull-like. They're overdoing the eyes. The eyes have black screen in them, which it looks like it has black screen in them. Yeah, it does. Like, it looked very foamy in part four. And in this one, it just looks just terrible. In this one, they just way overthought, no, we got to make a brand new mask. Yeah. It's a new generation. Watch out, people. We're going to make our mark with Halloween 5. And yet, what I will give this film is that I think that it understands Michael a lot more than Part 4 did. You give this film too much. You give this film too much. Let me just, let me just explain. <laughs> I do think Don Shanks, who was the stunt performer, did a very good job as Michael. With the exception of those bits where they had him hold up the knife. Because they did that too much and he looked silly. Hmm. But I think that's a directorial thing. Don Shanks, again, he's a big guy. He's a stunt man, but I think he has this kind of lean quality to him. He's got this nice sense of movement to him. And what I like about Michael, and we complained about this in part four, was the personality of Michael. There wasn't any. Mm. He was just a brick wall who just came in and killed people. This one, we see him stalking. We see him playing games. We see him wearing disguises and luring people into traps. We see him thinking about things. We see him reacting to things. We see him in pain. You know, this is a Michael that is a character, and it's a character that I recognize as the Michael from the first two movies. I could see that. I especially love in that bit where he gets Tina in the car and he's wearing the boyfriend's mask, and she leans over and kisses him. I love that you can see his eye <laughs> just getting wider, and then his fists just clenching on the steering wheel. This is a Michael who is in a moment where he doesn't quite know what to do. That's a classic Michael, yeah. You know, and I like that a lot of this film is, again, from Michael's point of view, as he's following people, getting the lay of the land, learning who these people are, and gradually building scenarios in his head, you know, in terms of what would be the right moment. And then he's back to building dioramas, like he builds that one in the attic. That's true, he does. He goes back to his old little uh, workshop. <laughs> I'm not praising the filmmaking, but I just think, at least on paper, and I will again credit Don Shanks' performance, I do think that this is a nice return to form for the character of Michael and has that aspect that we thought was missing in part four. That sex scene is on right now. It's very <laughs> distracting. Half this movie is a sex scene. I love about that sex scene where you have a guy who's dressed as Michael and Michael, and they're both going in and out of this scenario, not knowing that they're both creating confusion. I don't know. I, there were some moments there that were effective. Yeah, I do like the playful aspects. I will give you that. And uh, you're totally right. His hand is burnt. I see his hand in this frame, and it's still burnt. Which does not throw out continuity, because we do have a few bits where you see Michael without his mask in this movie. Mm -hmm. And it is Don Shanks, who Don Shanks is a six foot, I want to say two or three Native American man. And the thing is, they don't do any makeup on Michael here, despite the fact that you see him out of masks several times. And he looks like a six foot three Native American man. Nor is he burned. No, it's true. Nor does he have bullet holes in his eyes. <laughs> no, no, he is missing the bullet holes. He has like no battle damage. Not at all. Oh man, this movie's bad. I'm just watching it right now and it's uh, the mask. It looks like it's going to fall off constantly. Yeah, and it's too big. It's such a big mask. Yeah. And I will say, I do like that scene in the attic between him and Jamie where, you know, he takes off the mask and she sees the tear in his eye. Yeah, because that's in line with what Halloween's about, where he actually has those moments of hesitation and consideration for his family members. Because I don't even know if he knows why he's doing what he's doing. And sometimes it seems like he's actually torn up about it, which I kind of enjoy instead of just the blind, like, the killing blind, machine. The yeah. killing machine, yeah. I like that too, because there's so much more that's interesting about a killer who still chooses to do these things who still takes action, despite the fact that you can see he's conflicted about it. Yeah. You know, and then also, as we mentioned the last one, where he was literally the Terminator, you couldn't do anything to him. Here, it's again, you do see that he is being hurt by everything he's going through, but he's still just pushing on because he doesn't give up. Yeah. He just refuses to stop. He's just an asshole. <laughs> he's a monster. But, but she can kill you, Michael. She can kill the rage inside of you. Where are you getting this information from, Loomis? I don't know. I even love that bit there where Michael is standing out in the woods and Loomis is yelling at him. But he's yeah. like, I don't see you, but I know you're there. He's right there. You can see him. He's in your line of sight. Yeah. Stop drinking. His mask is practically glow in the dark. Where are you? Come inside. I want to make you soup. It's almost <laughs> as though there was a gaffer on set who was spotlighting it. 
It's true, yeah. Plus, a lot of things pop up more so in digital later on. Yeah. Like all the James Bond openings from the 60s and 70s. Nowadays, it's just nipples all over the place. But yeah, no, I mean, and like speaking of the scene that you just went through, Tina's best friends, you know, who are just, again, like in the last movie, just pure slasher film fodder. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So many times the police are like, you shouldn't go out there. And they're like, yeah, we're just going to live our lives. Well, when your police officers walk around with comedic clown horn sound effects. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Wah, wah. They should have got Don Knotts in this. <laughs> I will say I actually like the idea of those two cops. Because they are nice for cutting tension at times. Yeah. I like the bit here where they almost shoot spits and they're just like, it's good for you. We're not good cops. I know. They just could have executed a little bit better. Well, not with the sound effects. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the sound effects and like, you think I'm a child. <laughs> oh, there's so many things in this film where they just could have executed better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the scene where they're killed, where they see Michael standing there with a the bloody pitchfork and they're like, hey, buddy, come over here. Come over here. Yeah. And Michael is just like, hey, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Freebie. I almost would have expected him to not kill them because it's like, this is too easy. This is too easy. Yeah. He could have just like shook his head and been like, God, it's not worth it. He's now become Christine in the movie. It's him riding around in the car, driving over Christmas trees, trying to get Jamie. You're all shitters. <laughs> That's what drives Michael. He thinks everyone's a shitter. That's right. Anyway, <laughs> anyways. The uh, scene at the end is pretty tense with Jamie running through the house from Michael. Yeah, that is kind of effective, especially the whole scene in the uh, laundry chute. Yeah, the laundry chute scene is great. I think that scene is one of the highlights of the movie. Yeah, I would say so. It reminds me a lot of what they did with The Descent. Did you ever see The Descent? I have not yet. There's a scene, and it's more terrifying than anything else in the movie. I won't give away too much. Close to the beginning, because they're spelunkers. They're going through all these caves, and this one cave is super narrow. And halfway through, the one girl has a panic attack. Ah. And it's just close up on her face, and her breathing, and it's just the sound, and the way that they do it. It's just so claustrophobic and so terrifying, and I'm like, that is genuine horror. When it's a situation that is somewhat manageable, but you just can't, and there's an outside force trying to get you. I find that that's more horrifying than a bunch of other nonsense and cars driving around. Right. When she's in the laundry chute and it's showing her inability to sort of get out of the situation, but there is still a possibility of getting out of the situation. It's just really hard. I find that to be very effective. And they pulled that off quite nicely, except for the fact that Michael knows exactly where she is at all times. <laughs> right. That was a problem. Was you should have seen him searching the house and then like her shoe fell off. Yeah, the shoe falling off would have been great because they focus on the shoe. And I'm just like, if you were good at your job, you would have known to let the shoe fall off slowly, make a sound, have him spin around and then head for the laundry chute. That would have been great. And Daniel Harris as a trooper, there was no stunt person in that entire thing. That's Daniel Harris in a laundry chute. Oh my God. Climbing without a rig. She's climbing up it. She's bracing herself. She's like, well, I mean, that shot of the character falling down and then there's that impact. They just dropped some sandbags. But yeah, I mean, Daniel Harris, God, her performance in this movie, she just goes all out. I am in awe and also mortified that she had to go through this. I mean, and I think part four was a better film and was a better thing for her as a character. Yeah. I honestly think it's her performance in part five that cemented her as a fan favorite. Yeah, I would uh, agree. This is probably one of the strongest performances in the entire franchise. Because if you remember nothing else, you are going to remember her performance in this movie. It's true. Is she active these days? Yeah. She continues to act in a lot of cult horror movies, but she directs now. Oh, good. She's been making films. She has a convention circuit. Remember, she actually came back in the Rob Zombie Halloween. Oh, did she? And unfortunately, because he then puts her through some horrible shit. Of course he does. It's Rob Zombie. Yeah, while topless. Oh, Rob Zombie. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she's just is one of those rare child actors that really gives a very committed performance. She never really left into stardom, but she did keep consistently acting. She was in like films and TV shows throughout the 90s. She's kind of gone back to the cult horror market. Hmm. But throughout the 90s, she was in a lot of teen comedies. She was still around. Okay, well, good for her. What about the character of Billy? Which one's Billy? Billy's the little boy who has a crush on her, who has a stuttering problem. Oh, yeah. Sort of fills the Tommy role in this one. He's a bit of a non-entity. I kind of forget he's there. <laughs> I mean, he's sweet. Yeah, he's fine. But he doesn't get to really do much. Yeah. I know the script had an additional sequence near the climax where his character was supposed to be like an expert BMX biker. 
And in that whole bit where she's getting chased through the field by Michael in the car, he was supposed to show up with his bike and be like, hop on. And he's like riding the bike as Michael's chasing him. That sounds like a much better movie. (laughs) Yeah. I want to see that movie. I did kind of like how that car crash, you then just get that sound of the horn blaring and everyone's like, oh, thank God, it's finally done. And then the horn stops. Yeah, I did appreciate that as well. It reminded me there's a scene like that in Halloween 2 where the one guy lays on the horn accidentally. Yeah. You keep looking at the door to see Michael come out, which is terrifying. That was something. That was nice. Who else do we have here? We had the return of Sheriff Ben Meeker. He's a returning character? Is he the guy who... Uh... Yeah, his daughter was killed in the house in the last one where the shotgun was shoved through. Oh, uh, he did it by the book, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's that whole scene with him and Loomis where Loomis is like, you don't have to tell me. I remember what it was like. And he pulls off his glove and holds up his burned hand. Look, look. (laughs) Oh, there's the sheriff right there. He's talking his walkie talkie and Loomis is stumbling around. You're at the scene in the house. I should point out that was one of the other big cuts from the script. Even though I know that they filmed it was you have this whole thing where they have the house all decked out with cops and snipers and booby traps and all that stuff. But then, you know, they get the report that Michael's at the hospital, so they all run and leave. Mm -hmm. How it was originally filmed was that he splits the police force. Half the police force leaves with him to go to the hospital, and half, like, all the snipers and all that stuff stay rooted at the house. Because I think when he leaves, you only get the one cop out front, and you get the one guy upstairs with Jamie. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. What it was supposed to be was you were supposed to have a whole scene of Michael going through the house, taking out all the cops. Okay, yeah. And instead of just being a brick force like Terminator, he's like out thinking them, out maneuvering them, creating confusion, getting them trapped in their own booby traps. Like there was supposed to be a spike trap that was at the front door that he catches one of them in. As Loomis and that other cop are having their argument upstairs, there's this whole carnage that's going on downstairs. That would have been pretty cool, too. Sort of like a Batman Arkham game kind of version, stealth mode. (laughs) Though I do like the cop who's upstairs. That's a character actor who I've seen in a ton of stuff, Fenton Quinn. Oh, yeah, me too. I know him very well. This was early in his acting career, actually. He did this and Twin Peaks and then suddenly was popping up and everything. He seems like he would play like a sheriff. He looks like he could fit in anything. He's your typical, if you're populating a quirky small town, he's one of your quirky small town guys. Yeah, he's got one of those faces. He'll be a fisherman or a principal or a cop or whatever you need him. Yeah, absolutely. He's got that golly shucks willikers type of look. Yeah, he looks like he could have theories about Bigfoot. (laughs) (laughs) In a good way. He's a good good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I'm trying to think of any other... Well, I mean, we have the odd opening of Michael is found by a hobo in a shack and is just left on a bed for a year. As you do. I want to see the actual scenes of that hobo feeding him soup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least they acknowledge they took the mask off. I know, but he's still wearing the same clothes. That man would stink to high heaven. He would not be able to hide from anybody. And that was, again, a thing that they changed was the way it was originally written and filmed was it was supposed to be a character nicknamed Dr. Death, who is this weird, bizarre, tattooed occultist guy, the skinny guy, I want to say in his 30s. You can still see some stills of it on the DVD, (laughs) who captured Michael and then spent that year performing voodoo rituals over him (laughs) until Michael then woke up and nailed the guy to his own inverted crucifix. Of course. (laughs) Irony. They screened it with that and everyone was just like, what the fuck? (laughs) And it's like, you're already stretching belief with Michael survived falling into a mine shaft because, oh, look, there's an underground river. Yeah. It just happens to be there. And then he lurches up to a hobo shack for a year. It's like the opening of Alien 3. Yeah, where they're just like, let's just go crazy. We don't know how to get him there. We just, we know we want to bring Michael back, but we're not sure how. Here. If you're overthinking that much, just put him in space. There were talks. There were talks. I believe it. Down to the point of John Carpenter even being in talks for a Michael Myers in space movie at one point. Oh, God, I would watch that. (laughs) I'm not sure if that's in any way tied to Ghosts of Mars. We'll see when we get there. Oh, the score. Did you have a chance to listen to any of the score? I did not get a chance, unfortunately. I will say, I think it is actually Alan Howard's strongest Halloween score. Because, you know, we always had those problems of him and his rhythms and beats and all that stuff. Yeah. But this one, the director, and I will give the director credits for doing something right. 
listened to some of his music and was like, this isn't bad, but I want you to get it done with real instruments instead of synth. Huh. And for some reason, that just makes all the difference. So it's a real piano, it's real drums, and it has this nice atmosphere to it. He has this nice chaotic bits where he has different versions of the theme overlapping in and on itself. He kind of broke free from his rhythms and actually got a little chaotic and experimental at times. And I actually think it's a good score. I thought it was actually good to listen to. I thought it was effective in the movie. It's one of the few things I will give the film points for. There you go. I will have to check it out. Oh, you're right. He does not hold that knife well. No, and again, I've chalked that up to bad direction, because you just know this director was like, and hold up the knife, you'll look menacing and threatening. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and he's not very committed to it. <laughs> no, and he keeps doing it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the one big elephant in the room, yes. The uh, the man in black. That's right. The man in black, the mysterious figure, and then that whole ending. The uh, we don't know what we're doing, but here's some mystery to keep you coming back. <laughs> what did you think of it all, Alex? Uh, it signified nothing to me. <laughs> and what I love is on the DVD, everyone involved in the movie was like, there was no thought behind it. We were just told, put in something that we can use for the sequel. Yeah. In the script that I read, it was just supposed to be a man in an Italian suit. And I'm just like, oh, is he going to be like one of those automatons from Halloween 3? Uh, that would have been cool. That would have been cool to loop in Halloween 3 and tie it into the druidic cult from Halloween 3. That would have been something, yeah, instead of nothing. <laughs> yeah, the director was literally like, I had no idea what any of this meant. Did um, Twin Peaks come out around this time? Yeah. It feels like a Twin Peaks move. Because Twin Peaks had just debuted around this time, and it does feel like a kind of serialized story element. Yeah, that they would just put something in kind of weird and be like, hey, there's more going on to this story. <laughs> we don't know what it is. But it's even weird how they'll do it of like, let's introduce this guy in these cowboy boots as he comes off of a bus and kicks a puppy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> or like Loomis is alone in the Myers house wandering around the house exploring it and then we see that this guy is also walking around the house shadowing loomis you can't do that in an abandoned house without someone hearing that you're there exactly you just can't and then the whole tattoo thing was something that was literally just thought up on set that him and michael have the same tattoo that was just the producer mustafa akkad going like i need there to be another tie give him a tattoo <laughs> I don't mind that, giving it that sense of mystery, because then you're like, what is this about? Where If it's just some guy, then it doesn't really mean much. And they were like, does this mean that this guy is Michael's twin brother? Is he his father? Is he his uncle? We don't yeah. have a clue. Nobody knew. No, not really, no. Mustafa was just like, throw it in there, I'll figure it out in part six. <laughs> and I know that part six does pick up some of these threads, but I don't remember how all it does. I think it's in the beginning, and then it kind of just goes back to the way it was. Was, if I remember correctly. I know the Cult of Thorn is a persistent thing throughout that movie. Right, yeah. Again, my memories of that movie are mostly relegated to Paul Rudd. Pretty much. I remember, like, a scene with Paul Rudd, and that's about it. <laughs> I remember that he's in it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I remember how it opens, but I'll have things to say about that, and we'll get to it when we get to it. Oh, yeah, if I remember correctly, it's not nice. No. I want to say something here, but I don't want to give anything away. Yeah. And then the whole escape from the jail where the guy goes into the jail and busts Michael out. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like the end of a Resident Evil movie where it's like, we just got to do a big fucking cliffhanger. Yeah, it, that's exactly, that's a good point. Yeah, I believe that as well. Where they're just like, you do something crazy and then you come back just to see how you get out of that mess. Any final thoughts on Halloween 5? She does, at one point, when she's in the laundry chute, use Michael's knife as a springboard to help herself <laughs> up, which is pretty cool. Yeah, she puts her foot on it right as Michael pulls down on the handle, and she goes, whoop. Yep, which is a neat thing. <laughs> that was delightful. It was delightful, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a movie. It was on, and then it wasn't on. Some parts made me sad. Some parts made me tired. <laughs> I think it is definitely the point where the franchise stops becoming watchable. Yeah, we're not really going to get it back until 7. I'm very curious to see how 7 holds up. I am too, because it's been a while, and I remember loving 7. Yeah, I loved it too. Halloween 1 is great. I think parts 2 and 4 have problems, but they are worthy sequels. I don't really care for them, but I will say that they feel like Halloween movies. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's like if you want to see more Halloween movies... You could do worse. Yeah, they're not going to hurt. Yeah. And Halloween 3 is not a good film, but it is an interesting film. Yeah, I will give it props for thinking and trying. <laughs> this one is just a mess. Yeah, it's not a good scene. 
at all. It doesn't come together. It doesn't have any idea of what to do. No, it just kind of walks around and then just leaves. It's poorly executed. So poorly executed. It's mean. It makes some very bad choices. Agreed, agreed. But yeah, if you like Daniel Harris in part four and you just want to see her really knocking out of the part with a really great performance, yeah, just don't expect the rest of the film to live up to that performance. Yeah. Expect the rest of the movie to make you sad. And this is it for her, right? As an actor, she's not in part six, is she? Her character is, but not with her. Yeah. We'll get to it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Stay tuned, folks. If you thought this one was exciting. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so that's Halloween 5. In summation. (laughs) Yeah. In summation, there's a character named Spitz. That's right. There is. And he dies. Oh, God. We never even mentioned Tina's boyfriend, Michael. There's two jerk off boyfriends. <laughs> In the script, he was named Michael so that you would have a scene where Michael is stalking Tina. And suddenly she starts yelling the name Michael and Michael Myers is like, whoa, wait, what? What? Is she on to me? <laughs> and then Michael pulls up in a car. Uh... You didn't get that scene in the movie, so I'm not sure why it's still there. I don't know. I looked it up. Halloween 6 does not come out until 1995, so it would take six years for another film to get off the ground. That is a long time. Yeah, that's crazy. It would, I'm surprised they didn't reboot it. I guess maybe that wasn't done as much back then. Yeah, I think this is just this is where the series falls apart. Yep, and will continue to fall apart for apparently six years. I am not looking forward to seeing Donald Pleasance in part six. Uh, no, that's going to be super depressing. At least, you know, we got Prince of Darkness. Yeah, no, he was great in Prince of Darkness, which is strange. It's like night and day between Prince and Darkness and this one. Yeah. Oh, I also forgot to mention, it was interesting that there were a lot of echoes between this and the plot of Eyes of Laura Mars. Yeah, you were saying that last time. The psychic visions of the killer, but again, they don't really do anything with it. No, no, no. With the whole thing of Michael's point of view shots being such a part of this franchise, why wouldn't we see Jamie's visions of seeing situations through Michael's eyes? Absolutely, and then it would tie into the fact that she's psychologically and psychotically linked to him. Right, you know, and especially that would tie into the end of part four, where, you know, we cut to her point of view as she stalks the stepmother. Yeah, absolutely, and it really never fully plays into it. They sort of, like, hint that it could go there, and that she's a danger, and she could possibly succumb to him, but no, it never really plays with that at all. It just kind of, like, does its own thing after that. I mean, the Halloween 5 that I would have liked would be you carry on the fact that Jamie has been corrupted by the same thing that happened to Michael, and you have Rachel and Loomis struggling over how to deal with this in terms of treat her or lock her away, while Michael is returning, and instead of trying to look for her for a solution, he's trying to lure Jamie into following his path. Yeah. Kind of coming under his wing. You're describing an interesting movie. (laughs) And again, I would love to have read that initial idea for part five by the people who made part four. Yeah. Where they were going to kind of do that. And they didn't do it. No, they did not. Because this director walked into the producer's office and threw that script in the trash bin. Yeah, pretty much. And said, I can do better. And no, you couldn't. No. Hubris. (laughs) So I think that concludes Halloween five. Yes, it does. The revenge of Michael Myers. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Not with a bang, but with a lurch of Dr. Loomis. That's right. Yeah, it's really not clear. Like, I finally saw it now that you mentioned that he has a heart attack, and I'm like, oh, I guess he does. He just kind of looks at Michael, and I'm like, but he's always doing that. And then drapes on him. Yeah, he does. He looks like he wants to kiss him. He just tucks onto Michael like a warm blanket. It's true. A warm blanket warning of evil. That probably stinks. (laughs) Of bourbon. They couldn't even make an explosion in this movie. Come on, guys. We'll just keep going here while you finish it up, because you're almost done. Yeah, I'm very close to being done. The one guy's like, oh, go check that out. You stay here in this car, little girl. Yeah. (laughs) I actually do like that shot of Michael in the jail cell. Where he's just kind of sitting there? Yeah. It reminds me of The Guest. Did you ever see The Guest? No. You should watch The Guest. But what I like is that he's just kind of kneeling there, almost holding his chain like a rosary beads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Showing the waiting patient thing that they should have done a lot more in this movie. I don't know what that means, but it feels like something Michael Myers would do. That's true. They could have spent this whole movie just treating her with Michael sort of on the periphery, coming in with only like vague hints 
keep it like, is he there? Is he not? That would have been so good. Well, no, you make that the big midpoint twist is where he then breaks her out of the hospital. Yeah, for sure. And then the whole big thrust is Michael trying to get Jamie to kill Rachel. When you kill Rachel, you'll have fully crossed over the way I did when I killed my sister. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, without speaking, because if Michael speaks, then everything goes to hell, Rob Zombie. Yeah. <laughs> He's pretty much directing Frankenstein at certain points, Rob Zombie. Yeah. Ah, I hate living. White trash Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Why does he have to make everything about his childhood? I'm like, they're in Chicago. Oh, she's still giving it at the end. She's still bringing it. That whole bit of her walking through the police station around all the corpses yeah. of police officers, which, A, you should have run away. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I don't know too many kids who would be like, yeah, I'm going to go investigate this further. <laughs> but no, yeah, Daniel Harris bringing it. Yep, absolutely. And now it's over. <sighs> nice orange font there, guys. Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. fun story about going to see halloween 7 with my dad yeah we went to a midnight showing we were the only people there and there was a loose nail or staple on the chair in front of him and he ended up cutting open his leg oh no so it's like we're trying to find management to tell them that there's a sharp protrusion on their chair and they had pretty much already locked up the theater and left oh god that's amazing <laughs> so it's like just us an exit door and the projectionist who isn't listening to us <laughs> That's incredible. As my dad is sitting here holding in blood coming out of his knee and we're watching Halloween 7. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing.